My name is Nicole Foss. I uh, run a blog called The Automatic Earth with uh, my writing partner, uh, Raoul Lagi Meyer. We've been documenting the credit crunch and all sorts of aspects of limits to growth for nearly the last 10 years, uh, mostly on our own site, but previous to that uh, on the oil drum as well, which is a peak oil site. So my background is as an academic, but I've worked in a number of different fields. And what I do now is to pull it all together into the biggest possible big picture. Well, I think at the moment there's, there's a misconception that there's been decoupling. In other words, that people have the notion that we manage to have economic growth with a lot less energy than we had before. I would argue with that. I would say there is no such thing as decoupling, that the economic growth that we have is critically dependent on the energy that we use. The reason it looks like we've de-energy intensified our economies in a sense is that we offshored our, our energy intensive manufacturing, so the energy that we use for the economic growth that we benefit from is on somebody else's energy budget. So we haven't actually broken the connection at all between the, the economic economic growth that, that we see and the energy that it takes to do it. There's an incredibly tight correlation between those two things. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, we've just been increasing the amount of energy that we require to do everything in our society um, ex exponentially because we've had the capacity to do so. So we've been increasing our demand and supply has been increasing as well. So we've had this exponential rise in, in the use of energy, energy intensification because we had this huge energy surplus. So we had available to us an energy surplus the like of which no species on the face of the earth has ever seen before. And all species are constantly looking for, res for energy resources, usually in the form of food, obviously. But we just managed to find something that would allow us to enormously amplify our extractive capacity to obtain all kinds of resources and to build the level of socioeconomic complexity that we see. In the absence of the really high energy profit ratio energy sources that we use in the form of fossil fuels, the Roman Empire is probably about where you would top out in terms of the kind of concentration that you could see in the, the endless cycle of the rise and fall of, of empire. We probably would never have got beyond that point had we not discovered fossil fuels. We would have had other empires, but they wouldn't have gone to a higher level of sophistication than Rome. The reason that we did end up at a much higher level of sophistication, were able to build industrial society, was that we had access to incredibly high energy profit ratio energy sources, which means energy that you don't have to put a lot of effort in to get a huge return. So if you think about uh, the kind of energy return you would have seen in previous human societies or in for other species, how much energy do you have to put into obtaining an energy return? Well, in traditional farming, you'd put in about one unit for about five units back. And you could do better if you could use animal labor, for instance, which is why uh, European farming was uh, at a higher level than the South American, they had access to beasts of burden in the way that uh, South America uh, didn't have uh, at the time. So you can, you can amplify your energy returned on energy invested somewhat doing that. So you can produce a positive energy balance with food production that way. And if you're simply a large wild predator and you're chasing gazelles to make a living, you, you're going to have to get a significant return. More gazelle energy has to go in than it took you to get it or you're going to be uh, extinct very quickly. Quickly. But those energy profit ratios are low. What we had in the form of, of the fossil fuels that we had access to was a staggeringly high, unprecedentedly high energy profit ratio of the order of 100 to 1 in, in the, the early years of the energy industry. And now it's fallen substantially as we've moved through the easy supplies, things that were easy and, and cheap, both in terms of money and in energy to, to obtain. And we've moved into an era of much lower energy profit ratios, but still perhaps, well, arguably on average, about 10 to 15 to 1 uh, globally, depending on what fossil fuel energy source you're looking at. But that's still really very high compared to anything that, that people or other animals would have had access to before. However, we're now looking at moving into a much lower energy profit ratio regime 
with unconventional oil and gas and with uh, a lot of forms of renewables. Although the energy profit ratio for renewables is highly variable, depends on the technology, the project scale, uh, the resource intensity, wherever you've put it, so it will be variable. But on average, the energy profit ratio is considerably lower for uh, renewables as well than it is for conventional oil and gas. So we seem to think that we can move from the energy resources that built the level of socioeconomic complexity that we enjoy today to energy sources that are perhaps a tenth of, of that level and still do exactly the same things and still maintain what we have built, maintain our current level of socioeconomic complexity. The problem is that if your energy profit ratio falls by a factor of 10, your gross production would have to rise by a factor of 10 just for you to have the same amount of energy available. And we're not going to be able to do that. Energy, energy production is flat to falling, and the energy profit ratio is set to fall by of the order of a factor of 10 on average. That equals an almighty energy squeeze. It equals a complete inability to even maintain the level of socioeconomic complexity that we've built. I mean, the, the paradox for all these, these low energy profit ratio energy sources that we're looking at to, to fuel our future is that not one of them can actually sustain a level of socioeconomic complexity sufficient to produce them. So all of these things are complex, difficult, and expensive in both money and energy terms to, to produce. If you don't have a complex society, you're not going to be making photovoltaic panels any more than you're going to be uh, fracking and horizontally drilling and all sorts of other things. You're not going to be making concrete and rebar. You're not going to be mining rare earth metals. So all the things that are required, all the sophisticated complex things that are required in order to maintain our current society are not going to be there in a way that we can continue to do them. So. We're going to be forced to simplify. When we move into a lower energy society, we are going to find that it's very much simpler as a society. So what we need to do when we look at an energy future is to say, what will we be able to maintain? There's no point building that which will have maybe a 25 year lifespan and then it's over and you can't even maintain it. It becomes a funny shaped sculpture of some kind. There's no point putting our remaining resources into things that are dead ends. So we have to look at, at uh, where the, the boundaries of solution space lie, and we're not going to find solutions in things that depend on large amounts of high energy profit ratio energy or a large uh, degree of socioeconomic complexity. So we're going to have to look at simpler solutions in order that that which we do commit our remaining resources to, we will be able to maintain and replace when it reaches the end of its, of its design life in order that we're not just sending ourselves down a blind alley. So peak oil is essentially the point where you can no longer continue to increase production. It's not the point where you run out of oil. It's probably roughly at the point where half the oil that ever existed is still under the ground. But what we have produced in the earlier years is the easy, cheap supplies, the kind of, of things that were extremely accessible, like oil that simply seeps to the surface in Baku, Baku Azerbaijan, and has done since the 1850s, when, when it was noticed and first used. Or uh, reserves in Saudi Arabia, where you were looking at really permeable, porous structures where you're kind of sticking a straw in the ground and, and just sit back and wait for the huge energy return. So in those days, the amount of energy you had to put in was absolutely trivial compared to what you were getting out in return. And that was the upside. So we were increasing uh, what we were able to produce. We made lots and lots of discoveries, really good, high quality, large discoveries in uh, the early years of, of the 1900s, or so from the 1930s onwards. At first, we didn't even know what to do with it. We were producing all this, uh, this high-grade energy, but we hadn't yet got a society that, that used it for useful purposes. So we actually had to come up with ways to use it. And in doing that, we ratcheted up demand and then supply and demand and supply. So we, we had this increase in the, the energy that was available to us that 
was very high energy profit ratio and the range of things that we developed to do with it so that so that people could make money because if you have something if you can create a demand for your product then you can make a great deal of money and it's very interesting to look at some of the completely silly things that we've decided we need fossil fuel energy to do in one form or another not necessarily burning it maybe turning it into electricity so we've got to the point where in our current society just as a, a trivial example do we really need electricity to brush our teeth or open tin cans. It, it's not just the energy we're using to actually operate the equipment, but it's the energy, the embodied energy in the factories that make electric toothbrushes and electric can openers. And yet we, we've found all kinds of ways to use our energy surplus. So what we've done is we've built in this dependency now. Now we have a structural dependency on large amounts of, of cheap energy. And yes, it, it will not be the end of the world if we can no longer brush our teeth electrically, but there are a whole lot of things that we've built into the way our society functions that we would have a lot harder time with. Uh, when we've seen blackouts, say the eastern seaboard blackout, uh, for instance, in, in the States, there have been two of them, the technology traps close. The, the power goes off and all of a sudden things don't work. People end up stuck in elevators and stuck in subways. That They can't heat their homes. They can't use their well pump for water. There's so many things that when, when the effects of cheap energy are cut off, all the more so if it happens very abruptly, then the consequences are significant and they, they knock on. So in, in England in 2000, there was a, a blockade. Truckers were blockading refineries to uh, protest against the high price of oil at the time. They almost caused a cascading system failure, even in the absence of actual shortages. They were only protesting high prices, but they almost created the kind of scenario where you, you couldn't have society function and the structural dependencies would have started to hit home. And once you hit one, often it cascades into hitting others. So they came very, very close to crashing the system in 2000. And when we move forward into our era of lower energy profit ratio energy sources, where now we're going to have to be working very much harder to produce much anything, we're simply not going to have the energy available to do that, that which we have done. So effectively, it's going to be those technology traps are, are going to be closing. Those structural de dependencies are going to bite us in the behind. I mean, for instance, we live in places where, for many of us in the developed world, uh, we need to have a car to get to anywhere we can get food. We don't have the capacity to produce food or water or energy on site. We require the infrastructure that brings all those things to us or the infrastructure we have to use to go and get them and bring them back to where we are. When you can't do that anymore, either because you can't put fuel in your car because you can't afford it, or your car died and there isn't the embodied energy available to produce new cars and have people replace the, the fleet as it gets older, you no longer have the capacity to do that. And then if you're stuck somewhere where you cannot control any of the essentials of your own existence, you truly are stuck. You won't be able to be there anymore. So all kinds of things are going to shift when we move into this much lower energy uh, era. And, and I think we're, we're going to find over a few years that life gets very much simpler. It isn't going to mostly happen instantly unless there's a power blackout. That happens very fast. But we're going to be sliding down the slope of, of Hubbard's curve, if you like. The, the back side of Hubbard's curve is really where the gap between the energy in and the energy out starts to widen enormously. So if you look at the production curve, it's likely to look like a bell curve. But if you look at the net energy curve, it's going to be much steeper on the downside because of all the extra energy that you have to put into to energy production. So. If you look at, say, David Murphy's work on energy profit ratios, his, his graphs suggest that in about the space of maybe 20 years, you could see energy supply just collapse. And that's actually before you start to take into account any of the issues to do with uh, the financial system and the, the other forms of instability that will be coming down the line at the same time. So that's purely in terms of, of energy supply, what we can hope to get out. And you look at all the things that we're producing now, apart from all the, the obvious non-starters like, like fracking, 
things like the oil from Iceberg Alley off the coast of Newfoundland, where your oil rig could get sideswiped by an iceberg at any time, or people wanting to go and drill in the Arctic, you know, the deep offshore, thousands of feet down, thousands of feet below the sea, and then thousands more feet below the, the bottom of the sea. And you look at what can happen with, say, Deepwater Horizon, where you have one blowout and the amount of energy and resources you had to commit to trying to deal with that, even as pathetically as they did, is absolutely staggering. Think what that did to the energy profit ratio for, for that, that industry at that time, the huge amount of energy that had to go into controlling the consequences of an accident. Well, the consequences of accidents go up enormously when you're working in unconventional oil and gas. The cost of, of dealing with them therefore goes up enormously too. So it's not just the energy you have to put in up front that's the issue when you compare energy in and energy out. It's also the energy you have to put in at the back end to deal with all the consequences, that the things that go wrong. And by way of another example, think what Fukushima, one Fukushima, did to the energy profit ratio for nuclear power. So there, there are an awful lot of ways in which we need to, to adjust our thinking about energy to really understand uh, what energy profit ratios there are going to be and what the consequences of, of that are going to be as we move forward into our simpler society. <laughs> I, would, I would laugh uh, to begin with. <laughs> Essentially, people, people look at the unconventional oil and gas in, in the wrong way. When people look at following the American model, they tend to say, ah, yes, well, the price of oil went up, so, so now all these things are, are economic, so now we're going to be able to access these huge amounts of energy that we could never access before, and so we don't have to worry about energy at all in, in the future. It's actually that the American example is not showing people what they think that it's showing them. What the American example really was about was not about producing energy at all. It was about producing bucket loads of money, which it did very, very effectively. Yes, by throwing bucket loads of money, other people's money, at, uh, at producing things with fracking and horizontal drilling, it was possible to raise liquid fuels output. But at what cost? The energy in compared to the energy out is scarcely a positive balance at all. In some places, it's even negative. And you look at these fields, say for, for shale gas, the fields have only certain sweet spots. So people think, oh, well, there's this enormous area and we just are going to find lots of gas there. Well, you will find a fair amount of gas in certain places. But the only way to tell where those places are is to drill everywhere. So you're constantly on this drilling treadmill looking for these sweet spots. But every time you drill a dry hole, that's energy in that you got no return on at all. Even when you find something that does hit a sweet spot, you still have to compare the energy you put in to drill all the wells with the energy you got out from the few that actually produced something. And if you look at how long they produce for, it's not very long, maybe a few years, they typically deplete between 65 and 85% in the first year. So you get a, a, an amount of gas at the beginning, but then that tails off very sharply. Then you have to go out and drill some more and more and more and more. So you're constantly putting energy in. Now, this was not done for the sake of actually producing a lot of energy. The, in fact, the perception of glut pushed the price of gas down to about a third of the break-even price for production. So it's, it's not that anybody was making any money producing gas during that gas boom. Because if, if you, you think that something is plentiful, it's not going to be expensive. The hype said, oh, now we have 100 years worth of gas, we don't have to worry about anything. Well. We don't. Uh, if you look at, at the, the reserves, that, how long they're likely to produce, who knows, it might be five or seven years. It, it's really short. But the hype was such that you could convince people that if you had a land lease for an area, like something in the Marcellus, perhaps, the Marcellus Shale, you could convince people that this was an incredibly valuable thing, this land lease, which meant that people would pay you if you could if you were putting it up for sale people would pay you a lot more than you had 
bought it for in order to take that on. Now, the insiders knew perfectly well when they were selling these overpriced land leases that there was very little gas to actually recover, but they were perfectly happy to hype it and sell it for a tremendously high price anyway. This is the only way they were making money in, in the gas boom in the US. They were flipping land leases and it was a real estate Ponzi scheme. And that's, that's not a model that you want to replicate in other places. For one thing, it's more or less gutted the gas industry because they, they were only able to continue producing at staggeringly high financial risk, producing into an era of incredibly low prices when the cost of production was going up exponentially it was just a financial disaster. They kept doing it because they were just trying to grab share. Everybody was trying to grab their share of land leases and, and be in that market and thought, well, I know the prices will recover eventually. The ironic thing that is that the prices for shale gas will probably recover at the point where everybody's more or less given up, gutted the gas industry, and then there will actually be a gas shortage because staggeringly large amounts of gas burning infrastructure have been built in the US. There isn't going to be the gas to run them. So at that point, all the dependencies that have been built on this, this gas that we thought we had in abundance are going to also come back and bite us in the behind, and that's when gas prices are going to take a shot for the moon. And all of a sudden that's going to create, create tremendous problems. Now, what we saw, as, as people in the state started to realize this was what was happening in the gas industry, the rig count shifted. The rig count is a predictor, a, a leading indicator of production. The rig count started to shift from shale gas to shale oil. So when they were realizing, oh well, shale gas is, is not going to work out, they started shifting to shale oil and yes, shale oil, now that's the next big thing. We'll all go and spend all our money in North Dakota and create this enormous oil boom there. Well, they're about to, you know, doing what they've just done to the gas industry, they're now doing it to the oil industry, creating this perception of a huge amount of oil. Prices come down, you get speculators shorting the industry, and now the rig count is shifting away again. The rig count is falling for shale oil. So as the prices come down, this is gutting the business case for the oil industry in exactly the same way that it already did for the gas industry. And so that boom in North Dakota, all that money that got spent on, on fracking and, and, and things in North Dakota has produced a boom, but it's going to just be followed by a bust. So all that's going to be malinvestment. You had a huge amount of money going into something that was going to give you a very short-term return in money terms, and even shorter-term return in energy terms, and is then just going to be abandoned. And if you look at the amount of embodied energy in all that infrastructure that's only going to be useful for a relatively short space of time, that is wasted energy. All that energy up front is going to end up being more than all the energy they ever produced from those wells, I would be willing to bet. So this is, this is not an energy future. The analogy that I like to use to compare um, conventional and unconventional oil and gas to say that conventional oil and gas are a bit like saying, well, you're thirsty, you want to have another drink, so you go up to the bar and you get a beer and you sit there and you drink it in comfort. Unconventional oil and gas is what you do when the bar is closed and you can't get another beer, but you're still really desperate. So you decide that sucking spear, spilled beer out of the carpet is a good idea. So you're going to get a mouthful of dirt. It's going to be a huge amount of energy in for very little return. It's going to be a thoroughly unsatisfactory experience and in no way a substitute for what you can no longer have. But that's, that's essentially what we're doing when we look at moving to this unconventional oil and gas. This is not the end of peak oil. This is just the desperation phase of of a society of energy addicts attempting to suck spilled beer out of the carpet. And, and the, so we can't say that peak oil is dead. And in fact, we're accelerating the consequences of peak oil by throwing our remaining high-grade energy profit ratio energy sources at dead ends like this, creating all the, the infrastructure with all that embodied energy. We are wasting what we had left to send ourselves down these blind alleys that will achieve absolutely nothing. So we're profoundly misinformed when we think that we're simply going to be able to continue business as usual. And there are a number of parts of the world that want to follow that American example without ever understanding what the lessons that come from it actually are. 
you know, in, in the UK, it, it rather amuses me that they, they want to go out and, and frack so much of the UK, which is incredibly densely populated. An awful lot of the areas they want to frack are areas that are uh, very well healed uh, communities. And I think, well, that's a very interesting way for the UK Tory party to commit political suicide. It's by fracking the precious countryside that their own supporters happen to live on top of. It's a measure of the desperation in the UK that they're prepared to contemplate this. And they are desperate because the North Sea oil and gas, that was the only reason Britain ever got out of the winter of discontent in the first place, is depleting in double digit percentages per year. Uh, they've built all this gas infrastructure. So they, they went through the extra gas building infrastructure much, much earlier in the, in the 90s than, than America did. They built all this infrastructure. They're not going to have the gas to run it. They've shut down the coal industry. All their nuclear plants are at or near the end of their design life. The oil is depleting too. What on earth are they going to do? They truly are desperate enough to suck spilled beer out of the carpet. So I, I think we need to truly understand the lessons that come out of moving into unconventional oil and gas. It's by no means a solution, it's let alone a panacea for, for anything. Yes, I firmly believe that we are. So we, we're moving into a period where we're not going to be able to produce what we currently do. Even the temporary boom that the young conventionals have, have given us, the temporary increase in liquid fuels, the business case for that is being destroyed right, left and center with the current oil price. And really what we've seen since approximately 2006, when supply and demand first got tight, is we've seen these enormous amplitude swings of boom and bust. That's what happens when supply and demand get tight. You don't take a one-way moonshot. You have huge swings of boom and bust as supply and demand attempt to accommodate each other and money gets thrown at uh, the wrong things at the wrong time. Everybody jumps into trying to increase supply uh, in order to maintain demand, but then you move into the speculative bust phase. Some people make an awful lot of money on the way down as well by shorting things, but you, you simply drive the investment out of the sector, and that's exactly what we're seeing. So I'd be very surprised if we saw things like tar sands and, um, and all the unconventional oil and gas continue. You know, they, there, there's some variation in different kinds of, of sources, so not everything would, would go out of business at the same time. And as we saw with the gas industry, they will tolerate losses for a certain amount of time if there's other ways to make money, like flipping land leases or, or extracting uh, subsidies from government or something like that. If they can still make money at it in any way, that they, they will. And they may continue to try and maintain a uh, market by throwing money at it even if they had to borrow it for a while. Because basically the people who run the companies are going to get a share of somebody else's money that went into doing that, uh, that production. So they'll get paid up front regardless of whether there's any energy produced. So it's not going to be their problem if no energy comes out of it at the other end. It'll be the problem of the shareholders. So you get a disparity there between uh, who's making the money and when that gives people an incentive to continue going down that blind alley. So it may not dry up immediately, even although the business case is already gone because the price of oil today is lower than the, the break-even price for everything unconventional and by, by an increasing margin all the time. So I, I think we are going to see a, a certain amount of time that continues, but then that will fall off. And you'd also have to look at the refining industry to, to have a sense of what might happen with liquid fuel supply. And also uh, at the financial system, because when you move into a period of financial crisis, trade dries up. Trade does not do well. When you can't access letters of credit, people don't agree who's going to take the risk of shipping things from one side of the world to, to the other. Trade tends to break down. Well, at the moment, oil is fungible. Oil travels all over the world at similar prices wherever you are. You simply buy it. If you don't have it, you buy it from somewhere else. When trade breaks down, that isn't going to be possible anymore. In other words, there's going to be an enormous spatial variation in access to liquid fuels. In places that produce their own, don't, and that don't have to ship it somewhere else or import it from somewhere else in, in order to maintain the way they do things, they are going to have liquid fuels for longer, provided they can also refine them. If they produce them and refine them, they have the whole vertically integrated chain in the one country, then in those places, there's much less likely to be a liquid fuels crisis. But in places that are incredibly dependent on imports or places where they don't refine anything, 
this is going to be a problem. I, mean, I, I live in New Zealand, and one of the interesting things there is, although New Zealand produces 40% of the oil that it uses, its one refinery can't refine its own oil. They export all of that because it's light, sweet, crude, and they get a lot of money for it, and they use that to then import something lower grade, which is what they refine. But New Zealand is very likely to have an almighty liquid fuels crisis at some point because they simply won't be able to do that anymore. In Australia, where we are now, I think they're already setting up to address a liquid fuels crisis by moving into pilot plants for coal to liquids because there isn't going to be a huge amount of, of, of uh, conventional oil, but Australia has a lot of coal. So what they're doing, and I've uh, visited the plant in Ipswich where they're beginning to, to move in this direction, they're going to be t attempting to turn coal in, into liquid fuel. So there, there's going to be huge variation in time, uh, in different places. The world is going to get big again over the next while. So we've, we've managed to even everything out with our ability to trade everything during, during our, our years when things were going reasonably well economically. But we're about to move into a situation where those, those relationships, trading relationships, break down to the point where you can't move things around anymore and then the local circumstances matter a lot more than they have done for a long time. So we're going to see huge variation in that regard. Well, essentially, our expansion is a Ponzi scheme, so a pyramid scheme. It's, it's a speculative bubble. We've, we've had umpteen of these in human history. They go all the way back to antiquity. They're an emergent property of civilizational scales. So we go through these cycles of boom and bust, and we have done over thousands of years. This is simply the latest one. And the real expansion phase, the really powerful expansion phase, has been since the early 1980s. What we've done in that period is we've had an enormous debt-fueled expansion. Now, it's not that debt is always a bad thing. It depends what kind of debt you're creating. In the early years of, of our expansion phase, arguably we were borrowing money to start businesses that would generate an income stream that would pay off the debt. So in the early phase, before things go completely nuts, you have self-liquidating debt, which doesn't have to be a problem. But over time, we started borrowing money for pure consumption or borrowing money to gamble on asset price appreciation, which doesn't generate any kind of income stream at all. It may temporarily generate capital gains in the case of speculation, but it's doing so at the consequence of creating this enormous amount of debt. So people, it's called borrowing on margin. You borrow money, you throw it at some speculative investment, and as long as that continues to go up, then you don't have a problem. But people lose the connection between price and value. So at the period where things are going exponential, nobody cares anymore what they pay for something because they think someone else will always come along and pay more, more later. So they think that the supply of greater fools will be limitless. Unfortunately, it won't. Eventually, you do reach, the, you found the greatest possible fool and no one will pay more than this person did. At that point, all the, the everything dries up you, and the price just absolutely collapses. So we've had this huge amount of debt that fueled this price rise in stocks and houses and farmland and all sorts of things. Some things have started to fall already, like gold, for instance. We saw the, the effect of the, the bubble bursting in gold in various places. Housing bubbles have burst as well. Not everywhere yet, but they will. But because of all, all of this speculation was debt fueled, when the price of the asset falls, you owe more than the value of what you own. And then you end up with this staggering amount of private debt that amounts to promises to repay that can't be kept. So you end up in a situation where we're surrounded by drowning in promises that can't be kept. And everyone temporarily still thinks, but I insist that the promise made to me be kept. It isn't possible to keep all the promises because we have this much collateral and we just simply backed this many loans with it over time. And what you get at that point where, in very many ways, the greatest fool has been reached, you get this emperor has no clothes moment, where all of a sudden people realize that too many promises have been made and they're not going to be kept, that it's physically impossible to do so, and everybody dives on the underlying collateral, trying to grab their share of the underlying real wealth pie that's no means large enough uh, to, to satisfy everybody's claims on it. 
So our, our 30 year expansion since the 80s, when we deregulated finance, so it was able to go out and, and pick the pockets of the whole world rather than just our own people, and look for opportunities everywhere, generate huge amounts of speculative excess. In that 30 years, we've just built this enormous debt pyramid. If you look at the debt to GDP ratio in the, pretty much the entire developed world is floating around somewhere between 250% to 350% of, of GDP. That's, that's a huge amount of, of debt overhang. That's comparable to what the US was, was at at the beginning of the top tick in 1929, when you really had that period where you had enormous excess debt that had been created. So we're going through a phase that's very similar, only much larger scale, to what we saw in, in the Roaring Twenties, the last time we had a deflationary depression. So we've created all this, this debt overhang. We're about to see the, the price of financial assets and physical assets fall off a cliff. Not at the same time. Financial assets fall faster because they're virtual. Physical assets, it, like homes, it takes longer. But we're going to see effectively negative equity on a whole range of assets. We're going to see margin calls as the people to whom the debt is owed start saying, excuse me, but you seem to have more debt than your portfolio would justify, so you must sell something in order to pay down this debt, which of course then generates additional selling pressure, which pushes prices down further, and then you get another margin call. So we're about to see that downward spiral go into high gear. And it's interesting just looking in uh, the, the very recent past, this is, we're filming this in, in March 2015, looking at, say, Austria refusing to bail out its bad bank. And this is starting to arguably send shockwaves through the world of finance. And it's interesting, again, that Austria did the same thing in 1931 with the failure of Credit Anstalt, which precipitated a wave of bank failures that led into the, the Great Depression. It'll be interesting to see if it plays out that same way again. But there are a number of things that are starting to send shockwaves. So there's the Austrian situation, there's Switzerland dropping the attempt to uh, peg its currency to the euro, and there's the abrupt rise of the value of the US dollar. All of these very rapid changes are very destabilizing. And because we're hitting a very unstable situation with additional shock waves, it's very likely that we're going to see things get pushed over the edge into the next phase of the GFC, the financial crisis, much, much more so than in 2008. So in 2008, that was the warning shot across the bow. It was the first credit reversal for 60 years, but it didn't at that point lead all the way down into the full bust phase, the full correction of that entire 30-year expansion. So we still have the vast bulk of, of that retrenchment, that move to the downside, correcting that 30-year expansion. The vast ma majority of that is still to come. And that's really what we're going to be seeing over the next while. So we could actually see the financial world more or less collapse. So I, th I think we're going to see tremendous financial contraction in a relatively short space of time because there are so many financial assets in the world. They're a massive multiple of the entire global GDP. And the, the derivatives market alone, all of which is excess claims to underlying real wealth, has a notional value you know, in staggering numbers of trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars. And people still seem to think that those claims will be met. Well, that, well, they won't. So when people wake up and realize that, the destruction of financial value is going to be absolutely massive. And things can get repriced at pennies on the dollar almost from one day to the next. So I think when we start to, to tip into that kind of contraction and it becomes a self-feeding downward spiral driven by fear, we are likely to see substantial changes in a very short space of time. And then that will, of course, have knock-on effects on the value of physical assets, like businesses or, or homes, and things that take longer to adjust, but are, have just as far to fall in many ways as, as a lot of the financial things do. So it's, kind of, it's going to be a rapid phase of adjustment, and it's going to be like having the rug pulled out from under our feet. It's going to be a profoundly uncomfortable experience, and it's going to have huge knock-on effect on the energy industry that we were we were just discussing, uh, even more uh, compromising to the business case than, than what we've seen so far with, uh, with the adjustment of oil prices to the downside. So there's uh, plenty of excitement to come. The curse of Confucius is may you live in interesting times, and we, we do, and it's going to get more interesting. I don't regard uh, high oil prices as having been a cause of the GFC. 
We've had bubbles throughout history, long before we found oil or anything like that. You, you can have a speculative bubble entirely in the absence of a huge energy subsidy. Think tulips in Holland in the 1630s, for instance. So you do not have to have an energy subsidy to set up this kind of collective taking leave of the senses that a speculative bubble amounts to. So we were setting ourselves up for a speculative bubble anyway. Now, the, the, there is a role for energy in that energy was the primary driver of the expansion of socioeconomic complexity, and finance in its current form is one of the most compl complex manifestations of that level of socioeconomic complexity. So I'm not saying that energy didn't play a role. We wouldn't have reached this, this level of complexity if we hadn't had an energy subsidy to fundamentally drive it. But it's not energy that causes you to tip into that speculative bubble framework or mindset where people completely lose the connection between price and value. That happens anyway. And in fact, we, had a, we did see a primitive derivatives market in Holland in the 1630s over tulips. So we have seen this sort of thing happen before to some level of sophistication not at the level that we're at now. So energy was the primary driver of expansion and complexity, but that's not what causes contraction. It's, you don't need a trigger. People think that you need a trigger to move into crisis, so they look around for one, and they think, oh, well, Iran might be about to close off the, the oil tax, or, or there, was, there was a high oil price here, or something else happened geopolitically in some other place. We all got terribly worked up over Libya, or whatever it might be. These things are not triggers. They're simply things that happen at the same time. And we're not so much a rational species as a rationalizing species. So what we do is we look around for things that happened at about the same time, and we say, must have been that. that that's why we, we had this move. But you don't need a trigger. When you have reached the peak of a bubble, it's an endogenous dynamic that the boom will morph into bust. You simply reach that peak where there are no greater fools, where you cannot take that financial expansion any further, where all the income streams of the productive economy are no longer sufficient to service the debt that's been created, and you, you suddenly lose, you know, the emperor has, has no clothes moment, you lose the willing buyers, uh, the borrowers use willing lenders, the borrowers are all maxed out, the lenders suddenly wake up to the fact there's risk in the world and stop lending, so the supply of credit dries up, and this is what drives things into reverse. So it's not that the subprime mortgage crisis caused it either. That's far too narrow a manifestation of our credit bubble. It was an aspect of it. So the subprime uh, bubble was really um, trying to keep the whole mortgage lending system going and, in, and lending money to people who just had no ever no chance of, of paying it back. That It was obvious from the beginning that, that they were never going to pay this back. It was able to happen anyway because the banks didn't care if you were going to pay back the mortgage. They got paid up front for arranging the loan. They immediately turned around and sold the, the risk onto Wall Street through mortgage-backed securities. So provided that the risk didn't sit with them, they were able to push it off their balance sheet. They didn't care if the, the loan would be repaid. They had an, a perverse incentive to generate more loans regardless of the creditworthiness of the borrower. Now, that was around the housing market in the, in the U.S., and that went into a phase of bust. But the debt bubble is vastly larger than that. It's housing bubbles all over the world, not every single place, but many, many places. It's enormously swollen balance sheets of banks. It's derivatives exposure. And you've got enormously over-leveraged banks that are completely disproportionate to the size of their host economy where the, everything they own rests on an overvalued property market that's about to collapse. Things like that are so much broader than simply any kind of subprime mortgage issue. If you look at the housing bubbles in, in Europe, for instance, or, or here in Australia, they're bigger than the US was. The, the risk factors are absolutely staggering. And you look at what it costs to buy a, to buy a, a house in, in Melbourne. Same thing with Vancouver or, or Sydney or Hong Kong. There are so many places where it's a massive, massive multiple of average earnings. People can't people on the average wage couldn't hope to afford the average home. Even if they can borrow a lot of money, often that will still be out of reach. 
But if they are able to borrow the money, they're borrowing on margin, like we talked about before, to buy something that's overpriced, where the price of what they own will fall, but the debt will still be there. So it's a setup for a huge overhang of private debt. And that's what really drives things into contraction. It's not, it's not so much public debt. So Japan has had staggeringly large public debt for quite a long time. It's not so much public debt that gets you into trouble, although total debt to GDP is still a very important metric. It's more private debt that becomes the absolute albatross around the neck of, of an economy. And when you have a huge percentage of debt to GDP in your banking system alone, like, say, the United Kingdom does today, that's simply a measure of the likelihood that your banking system is going to eat the real economy for breakfast when push comes to shove, as we already saw in Iceland and, and Ireland. We look at the places where people are, are wealthy today, the places that are, are, that are at the top where people say, oh, they've got it right there. Everything's going well in Scandinavia and Australia and Canada and New Zealand and the BRICS. You, you look at, at the places where people are saying this is going well, and you think, uh, who was in that position five years ago? Iceland and Ireland, maybe? What happened to them afterwards? People are not looking at the lessons of history, even going back only five years. They're not looking at the risk factors that led to the bust that happened in those places. You're looking at the huge amount of, of private debt, looking at the overvalued housing markets, and all of those places that are now in, those, in that sweet spot are simply at the peak of a bubble. I mean, you look at the housing market in Norway. Everyone says, well, Norway is the best country in the world. It's got a massive housing bubble. And all that sovereign wealth fund is in financial assets that are going to get repriced at pennies on the dollar. Money is not going to be there in the future. They think they've saved their oil wealth so that they'll have, uh, they can buy a future with it in all sorts of ways, but it isn't going to happen. And then the debt bubble will burst and they're going to be in big trouble, just like Iceland before. So I think we, we just need to look in so much more depth at how these issues all fit together. What the role is for energy, what the role is for finance, which becomes the key driver at what time, based on the time frame for change in, in that subsystem of reality. And so how do they interact? So many things are counterintuitive. People People look at things in very simplistic, one-dimensional ways that are really not helpful at all. And I find that that's, that's not analysis. If you want to actually do some real analysis, you have to think systemically. There is nothing one-dimensional, nothing simple and, and really easily predicted on the basis of one single aspect about, about uh, our situation. So we, we have to be far more sophisticated in our outlook than that. Well, basically, the time constant for change in the world of finance is really short because so much of finance is virtual. So we've created this enormous pile of IOUs, which is the, the vast percentage of what we currently consider to be the money supply. And the value of promises to repay only exists as long as the promise to repay is credible. As soon as you move out of the period where people believe those promises, then the value of those promises disappears, you've just crashed the money supply. And you can do that very quickly because it's a psychological shift. It, you turn on a dime, confidence is gone, that's it. And, oh, not instantly, not usually from one day to the next, but, but in a much, much shorter time frame than any kind of change in, in the physical world. So because the time frame for changes in finance is so short, it's very likely to be the system that goes critical first. We're facing limits in a whole range of different ways, but the, the things that change most quickly become the key primary drivers to the downside when you tip over the edge. And it's that waking up to the realization that the game is over, the Ponzi scheme is about to collapse, that triggers these things. So a Ponzi scheme is... is is simply something that is generating this perception of an enormous, robust, large amount of value, but it's an illusion because it was all built on catabolizing the substance on which it was based. So we've been eating our seed corn, devouring our natural capital to a vast extent in order to blow the outer dimensions of this bubble to ever larger proportions. But because we've devoured the substance that it rests on, when it when it the limit is reached, it will simply implode. And implosions are not long-term slow squeeze phenomena. 
So we are going to see some kind of implosion in the world of finance. So think about the company Enron, for instance, some years ago. It was a great big energy multinational. It looked like a huge, robust company until two weeks before it ceased to exist altogether because it had blown itself this enormous bubble based on a whole lot of creative accounting and no substance at all. It had de devoured the substance that the company had originally been based on and the whole thing imploded and simply ceased to exist in the space of about two weeks. So we could see the same kind of thing happen with the derivatives market. Maybe not all of it in the space of two weeks, but when we start to see the realization that those promises can't be kept, there's a cascading effect. Now, people say, oh, well, you don't have to worry about the notional value of the derivatives market because it'll all net out. Well, it won't because there's a huge amount of counterparty risk in that system. So in the derivatives market, you can make any promise you want. You don't have to prove that you have the capacity to keep it. So you have people making all kinds of promises. Ah, yes, we'll offer you an insurance contract against the possibility that this uh, share price will fall or this country will default on its bonds or whatever it might be. So credit default swaps are these forms of kind of bogus insurance. Yes, we'll, we promise if it go, this goes down, then we'll pay you this amount of money. What that actually amounts to is, yes, you can send us your income every month. You, you, make, you continue to pay us. Yes, we promise faithfully that if it ever goes, the bet ever goes against us, that we'll pay out, knowing perfectly well they haven't the capacity to do it. But they've been sitting back and, and claiming payments all this time, providing something that has no value. So what we're very likely to see is at some point people will realize the CDS market is a joke. There is no insurance against a fall in the value of financial assets. At that point, this massive multi-trillion dollar market ceases to have any value. So you have a built-in meltdown mechanism. And it's worse than that even because CDS contracts are effectively like me being allowed to buy fire insurance on your house which gives me an incentive to burn it down. And I would suffer no consequences whatsoever in doing that, but I would expect to get a payout for the fact that I had insurance on your house. But I could only claim that insurance if the person I bought it from had the financial capacity to, to pay that out. And my point is they won't. So there have been all kinds of promises made that won't be able to be kept. Because the counterparty risk is so huge, even if you win bets, if you can't claim on your winning bets, you can't pay out on your losing bets either. So the whole thing just has this tripwire, if you like, that is likely to send it into this phase of, of implosion. And it doesn't take high oil prices or any other thing to trigger it. It's simply an endogenous feature of the fact that we've, we've blown this staggeringly large bubble. Well, we're likely to see the available energy supply decrease quite rapidly. And we've been discussing the effect of, of finance. That will probably buy us a certain amount of time in some ways, simply because demand for energy will fall if there's an economic depression and there's a whole lot less demand for energy because we're not doing as much as we were before. So if you look at the, um, the energy production projections in the absence of financial crisis, they suggest that we're approximately peaking now and that sometime in, in the next 20 or 30 years, you would expect supply to have fallen by perhaps 90 something percent, just as, uh, as a projection of the downslope of Hubbard's curve. That would be bad enough. Now, you will shift that curve quite likely if you suddenly drop demand for energy because we're not burning as much, we're not driving to jobs we no longer have, we're not replacing cars and computers and all sorts of things. This will cause demand to, to fall. But at the same time, financial crisis is also having an impact on the price of, of oil, which is causing supply to come down too. So it's not just that one thing will change. Temporarily, you're likely to get demand falling faster than supply, but over time, supply will come down a long way. And even although, we may not see all the, the extra supply disappear uh, within the, the original time frame that was projected. I mean, it may push peak oil out a little bit further. It will aggravate peak oil when we get there because supply will have collapsed. All the things we thought we were going to have going forward, all this unconventional oil and gas and, and uh, the renewable economy and everything else, 
none of that will have manifested because there wasn't the money, there wasn't the demand to justify uh, being able to do that. Plus, there wasn't the economic visibility. If you look at periods of depression, people don't see any way that they're going to make money on an investment when nobody around them has any money. So they can't say, ah, oh, yes, well, we would expect this kind of return, so we'll do this long-term project based on these expected uh, projections for what we're going to produce and what, it, what we're going to get paid for doing it. If you feel you have no economic visibility at all, you do not invest. So it's not just that, that things go out of business as they currently are because of the business case disappearing. The investment all dries up as well. So all the things that might have cushioned, to some extent, the downslope of Hubbard's curve are very likely to never happen at all, which means that even if we do shift the peak out a little bit further, when the energy decline hits, it's likely to be faster, you know, more sweeping than it otherwise would have been. And we cannot maintain what we currently have in the absence of the energy supply that it took to build it. So even although we've already got I think, a power system and a sewer system and, and existing homes and things like that, how long will those things last in the absence of the money or the energy that it takes to maintain them? This is going to be a major problem. And they don't, the infrastructure doesn't cease to have any value immediately. You only have to look at somewhere like India to see just how long you can coast without maintaining your infrastructure and still have it perform in some way. But nevertheless, you're asking for bigger and bigger problems. And the more problems you get in different kinds of infrastructure, the greater the chance that the failure in one will have a cascading effect on causing something else to fail. Just by way of example, for instance, if electricity prices, if, if, sorry, if gas prices go up for heating, people might decide to turn on the oven and open the door, thinking that electricity prices might be lower at this given time. So if we can't afford to, to heat with gas, we'll heat with electricity. Well, then you crash the power system because then all of a sudden the power demand has gone up. So when people are trying to substitute for what they can't have with something else, they can push so much additional demand onto that other system that they can send that one into free fall as well. So there, there are a whole lot of ways in which things are interconnected. And I think just the, the bare inability to maintain infrastructure is going to be the largest aspect of, uh, of what we, we see moving forward. It's not only that we won't be able to afford uh, what it takes to maintain it, we may not be able to get the parts either, because we don't make them in our developed countries, mostly. We import these from overseas, and so all the things we import from overseas, we can't count on being able to do that in a period of financial crisis, when, as we talked about before, you can't guarantee you're going to get a letter of credit, so shipments of things don't move. If you can't get the spare parts, and you don't have the money, and no one can afford what you were producing anyway, so you're not going to get a return from producing it, you have a major problem. So I think we're, we're going to see a substantial impact over, over the next 10 years. I think we're going to see energy issues. We'll see financial issues a lot sooner than that. We could easily see financial crisis this year. We could see things start to really pick up momentum to the downside in the world of finance this year. I'm not offering a specific timing prediction. I'm simply saying the risk is very high and increasing. And I'm thinking that we're going to start to see things happen sooner rather than later. With energy, because it's a physical system, the effect will take longer. But I think we are going to start to see energy crisis bite differently in different places, as we discussed before, but within the next 10 years. And at the point where energy becomes scarce again, like right now we feel we have glut, but at the point where everyone's panicking again over supply, that's when you're going to see drivers for even more upheaval in the world of geopolitics. Already you're seeing this. We saw the civil war in Libya. We've seen the ongoing debacle in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and you know, the problems in Syria as well. A lot of these come back to energy. The Ukraine is the big one at the moment. The Ukraine is an energy transit country connecting Russia, which still has some supplies, not as much as people typically think, but a reasonable amount compared to Western Europe, connecting Russian supply with its markets in, in Western Europe. And so the fact that Ukraine has been unstable and stealing gas and not paying for things for a very long time has, has really been part of precipitating the enormous problem uh, that they're seeing at the moment. And uh, someone, I forget, the, I forget exactly who, said that, um, that the Ukraine currently makes Greece look like Norway. 
So there are huge problems going on there that could precipitate a, a war in Europe in, in the relatively near future. So we, we are going to see knock-on effects in geopolitics, and the scarcer energy gets, the, the sharper the pressure on all these weak links in the energy supply system. So, for instance, I remember when you know, some years ago, looking at um, Russian supply uh, westward and saying, but that goes through Grozny. The Chechens were charging $6 a barrel to not blow up the oil pipeline. <laughs> you know? So when you get these weak points in the system, then you can get tremendously rapid changes anywhere downstream from that. Western Europe is going to be particularly vulnerable because it's depleted almost all its own indigenous energy reserves. And now it's depending on, on Russia and Algeria and places like that that are, that are not exactly stable parts of the world. And in places like that, where, where there's a huge structural dependence on energy supply, and you can see from a mile off that energy supply is really at risk, it, it's going to be a big impact in a short time. So this is, of course, why Germany uh, went for the Energiewende, where they're trying to convert to uh, renewable energy. But it's a drop in the bucket compared to what they're not going to have if they can't import the high energy profit ratios from Russia, uh, high energy profit ratio energy sources from Russia that they're they're used to importing, and they won't even be able to maintain uh, that infrastructure either, or the power system that actually delivers the energy to uh, where it where it's used. A lot of people are thinking that unconventional oil and gas will save the day, but a lot of people who are aware of limits to growth are making the same mistake with regard to nuclear and, and renewables. All of them are low energy profit ratio energy sources. So all of them have the same problem that they're complex activities that require a level of, comp of socioeconomic complexity in society that they cannot maintain with the energy that they put out. So if, if we're trying to, say, run a society on, on solar photovoltaics, and if you're lucky, an energy profit ratio of three to one, that's if you don't include the, all the energy infrastructure for getting the, the energy around. It, you cannot substitute that energy source for what we currently have. It simply does not deliver the amount of surplus energy that you need. And moreover, it doesn't deliver it where you need it, when you need it. It's not dispatchable. It's very distributed, very highly distributed. The way to do renewable energy is to have distributed demand to match your distributed supply. Then you can maximize your energy profit ratio by not building in an infrastructure requirement. So you can, if you have your solar panel on your own roof and you are using that energy yourself, the energy profit ratio will be a whole lot better. But you can do better than that. You don't even have to think in terms of necessarily needing electricity for which you would need photovoltaic panels. Well, what if thermal energy is enough? You simply put a solar thermal system, then you can heat your space in, in the winter if you live in a place where you need to do that. That's much simpler. Than, than producing electricity. You don't need an inverter, you don't need batteries and all sorts of things. You're just simply capturing the, the heat of the sun. Maybe motive power is enough, maybe compressed air. All of these are things that existed in the past. Say the old windmills in Holland were not about producing electricity, they were turning mill wheels to grind grains for, for people to, to eat. So there, there are lots of ways in which you can harness renewable energy in ways that make sense things that we did before the Industrial Revolution, some of which were absolutely genius, things that came from the ancient world using compressed air systems, for instance. So if we, if we do renewable energy in a clever way, rather than sim simply throwing our remaining fossil energy at it to create huge power systems and photovoltaics and, and things like that, if we, if we actually do it cleverly, we can create something with our remaining resources that we would be able to maintain and would give us a floor under how far contraction had to go. But that's not what we're doing. We're not putting things adjacent to demand. We're always, or far too often anyway, going for directly to electricity even when it's not electricity that we need. And think how silly it is, for instance, to produce solar power in order to run an immersion heater to heat your hot water when you could simply have used the, the energy, the heat from the sun directly to heat your hot water. And it's vastly more efficient. 
So we're, we're making mistakes when we, when we go in that route. And if you look at the Energiewende in Germany, they're building very large solar installations in cloudy places in Bavaria that then depend on all the, the infrastructure for delivering energy around. And this is not something they're going to be able to maintain. That That is not a way to create uh, a future that's based on renewable energy. Now, when here we are in Australia, and here the uh, the big fantasy comes from beyond zero emissions, so BZE, where they've been talking about a completely renewable-powered Australia by 2020. When I stop laughing, then I can explain you know, why that is simply not going to happen. And the time frame is ridiculous. But beyond that, they're looking at building things that are not adjacent to demand, that depend on a huge amount of complexity, huge solar plant and thermal plants in the desert, water dependencies in deserts, you know, far too um, optimistic assumptions about the amount of sunshine, about the amount of storage capacity they would have to build in in order to, to be able to do it. There's so many things wrong with this picture and really no capacity to understand how power systems work, what you have to do in order to maintain power quality, to have your power system work within the voltage limits that it must work in to not destroy people's equipment, and so many other issues about the way power systems work that are that I find are just conspicuously absent uh, from this model. But people people will believe that. You, you go around and you say, we can, we can do it and we, we'll have a completely renewable energy Australia, not not just for electricity, but for all energy sources. And there's just absolutely no way that this is a remotely feasible or realistic uh, model for, for trying to run an industrial country. We're going to end up in a future where we have distributed demand and distributed supply, just like we did before the Industrial Revolution, because that what will be doable, which means we're not going to be running an industrial economy because industrial economies have very concentrated forms of demand, big factories and things like that, and they require energy at particular times. For instance, if you're trying to make um, silicon chips, if you have a power failure and your dust uh, extraction mechanism stops working even for a second, well, there's dust in your system and you might as well bulldoze it and start again because now you can't run that. So we, we have all these dependencies on this consistent supply of, of energy and that's what we're not going to have. We're going to have energy when it's available and not when it isn't. It's going to be very expensive to be able to store energy and preserve it. That is one of the most expensive things, is trying to build in energy storage. Expensive in financial terms and energy terms as well. So I think we're, we're going to find that we, we really don't have the capacity to do very much of that, which will limit us to having what we have when it's actually available. But you don't run an industrial society on that either. The implications are really quite staggering. Well, essentially all human political systems exist to extract wealth from the periphery and concentrate it at the center. It's just that some of them do it a lot more effectively or efficiently than, than others. Capitalism does it extremely effectively. So it's a very effective mechanism for sucking wealth towards, uh, towards the center. What you do is you create a Ponzi scheme essentially. You're, you're sucking everything in, but you constantly require a larger and larger periphery to suck it into in order to keep expanding the capacity of the center. And if you can't keep expanding, it will collapse like any Ponzi scheme. So you have to keep reaching out further and further. So in our era of globalization, which is really the, the, the laissez-faire, the epitome of laissez-faire, if you like, the, the real height of capitalism, what, we, what we've done is we reached out spatially through globalization so that we could expand our periphery and suck wealth out of the entire world. And we, we did it through converting everything into financialization. So instead of having to only extract physical resources, we were able to suck revenue streams out in a financial form and concentrate those in the hands of the center. That's really what makes it a financial Ponzi scheme. We also, of course, did extract the physical resources too. And we, we co-opted the labor of people in, in the rest of the world. We actually forced things to scale up. So in many ways, through things like the Green Revolution, for instance, we made subsistence farming unfeasible. You can't monetize subsistence farming. There's no money involved in it at all. So you don't really want people doing subsistence farming. You want to force everything to be at a scale that you can monetize so that revenues can be extracted. 
So you have something like the Green Revolution that hands farmers seeds that coincidentally have hugely expensive inputs like fertilizers and pesticides and irrigation and all sorts of other things. In doing so, you dispossess the people who used to be the backbone of food production in places like India and you force everything to scale up to, to a certain degree that you can monetize. So, so in that way, we, we introduced mechanisms for ensuring that we could concentrate things at the center through, through monetization. However, we, we didn't just settle for reaching out spatially, we also reached forward temporarily to steal our grandchildren's lunch as well. Now, when you have one of these huge cycles of boom and bust, over the entirety of the cycle, it's nature's great wealth redistribution mechanism. But when you're at the peak, it's absolutely not. You have this huge concentration of wealth, which is, which is where we find ourselves today. And what you do when you create this virtual wealth You've put more money in people's pockets, albeit borrowed money, but you put more purchasing power in people's pockets. What do they do? They create captive demand. Someone else will come along to supply that demand. So you've front-loaded, throughout the cycle, you've front-loaded demand, then following on from that, you're front-loading supply as well. So in the boom phase, you have this enormous blowout of supply and demand which, which was based on the artificial stimulation of a financial bubble. Guess what happens in the bust phase? You get to pay all that back. So you've borrowed all that demand and capacity to supply, and we've blown out all of that in 30 years. We're going to spend the next several decades paying that back with less demand and less supply for everything than we would have had if we hadn't had the boom in the first place. The other aspect of why things, of why the system is unreformable, uh, Dmitry Orlov describes it just beautifully as functional stupidity. Now, I've argued that the effect of scale is absolutely critical, that when you scale things up, you move into these, these cycles of boom and bust as a function, as an emergent property of civilizational scale. But when you reach a certain scale, what you have is an, an organization that becomes insulated from, from the influences of the rest of the world. So it becomes impervious to evidence, if you like. It becomes internally self-serving. It exists to maintain its own power rather than existing to serve the functions it was originally set up to serve. And the things it ends up doing are functional in the sense that they keep that system ticking on. They, they keep it being able to kick the can down the road a bit further. But they're stupid in that they destroy the context in which this system functions. So it, the system is undermining its own ability to continue to function as it makes these completely stupid self-serving decisions all the time. As we move more and more into this incredibly short-termist, maximize profit in this quarter or even just this week or today, that very, very short-term kind of, of mindset with no regard whatsoever to the long-term necessities for resource supply or all the, the things that are required to keep a financial system actually functioning or physical economic system. So we, we've moved into this phase where all these large-scale in institutions are no longer really service, serving the purpose that they were meant to. We have the same institutions we had before. They just don't function in the way they did before. So we don't really have democracy, for instance. We have one dollar, one vote in an awful lot of places. We have systems that are bought and paid for. They're not responsive to what ordinary people want. Although ordinary people are perfectly happy to continue voting for free lunches and keep voting for the people who lie to them the most, and then that's exactly what they get. So it's not. I'm not implying that everything is just to do with that system. It's very much a, a, a bottom-up and top-down effect. So bubbles come from having predatory lenders and willing victims who are saying, yes, give me that empty bag. But, but what you've got now is this overhang of these institutions that no longer really function, and they're in the process of losing political legitimacy. As we scaled everything up, we went from personal-level trust in people that we actually knew to having to place our trust in institutional frameworks because we were operating at too large a scale to know everybody individually or at all. 
And so as we scaled things up, we built more and more complex institutions and we placed our trust in those institutions. And now the, the institutions have risen to the level of transnational you know, corporations and you know, the UN and you know, public and private institutions have all moved up to that transnational globalized level. And to some point, the trust actually manifested in those institutions. But when you move from expansion, where trust is getting more and more comprehensive, into contraction, where trust is disappearing, what happens is those large-scale institutions lose all trust. You can see this happening in the European Union at the moment, where you get you know, millions of demonstrators out demonstrating against austerity, waving around signs that say, you know, governments lose, anti-social governments lose legitimacy, which is exactly the point. People no longer see these governing institutions as behaving in the public interest because they patently, obviously, no longer do. They serve the, the, the wealthy, or they serve the 1% at the expense of everyone else. They bail out the top of the financial food chain at the expense of everyone else, impose all the austerity at, at the bottom. So you're just seeing that loss of legitimacy at the international level, at the national level in places that have already been pitched into crisis, and it's going to get smaller. Trust determines effective organizational scale. So as you lose trust, and you lose it very quickly, much more quickly than it took time to build it up, as you lose trust, the political legitimacy is gone. What you get are demonstrations, then you get repression. People are no longer following the rules because they no longer feel the rules that are in everybody's interest. Then governments attempt to force people to follow the rules, and then we realize that actually forcing people to do things involves a lot of money and a lot of energy, because now you're having to build surveillance mechanisms to see who's doing what, and control mechanisms to make them do what you want them to do. And of course, we're facing financial limits and energy limits. So we're going to be trying to concentrate the, those resources in the hands of the few at the very time when those resources are going to be in even shorter supply going forward than they are now. So what we're very likely to get is is these functionally stupid organizations grabbing even more power in the short term, but because at the same time they will have undermined their own continued existence, their ability to exert power at a distance is not going to last forever. It's going to last for a certain amount of time, but beyond that, all bets will be off, and then we're going to actually see these organizations collapse. That's the point where the center cannot hold any further. And then we're going to see things devolve to a much lower level of political organization. So people talk about neo-feudalism. All that means is just the largest scale effective organization is a lot smaller than what we currently expect. So you're going to have this situation where, where you might have local government at some point, depending on where you are, it will vary a lot with place. You're going to have things like local government perhaps be the largest size organization that actually works. So I talk a lot about the need to connect a top-down and bottom-up partnership so that you've got local government from the top and grassroots from the bottom meeting in order to be able to try and make sense of what has to happen within that local area that still lies within the trust horizon. And I think it's just going to be so important to do that. And we'll have to look at what level actually works in a given place. Some places may not contract so far, so the, the level of effective organizational scale might be bigger, um, in which case there'll be a lot more coordination capacity. In other places, it may be profoundly small. It might be a street or something in places that are really in uh, the depths of upheaval. But I think we, we still need to create that top-down, bottom-up partnership wherever we possibly can. And when, you have, when you're at effective organizational scale, you're not in the realm of funct functional stupidity. You're not beyond the point where you can have transparency and accountability and reflexivity. Reflexivity is the ability to respond to the signals that are coming from outside in ways that actually improve matters. So part of functional stupidity is that total loss of reflexivity, that total disconnect between the institution and its its surrounding context. So when we work within the trust horizon at effective organizational scale, we have that back again. And that's going to be very important moving forward. We have to have reflexivity. And in order to have it, we have to work at a scale that permits it.
Well, I'll just take uh, one uh, step backwards uh, based on, on uh, the substance of your question and say that what we're facing is not so much a problem as a predicament. So a problem suggests that there is a solution that gives you somehow gives you business as usual. A predicament is an acknowledgement that there is no solution in that sense. So there isn't anything that gets us business as usual, but that doesn't mean at all there's nothing that we can do. We just have to understand the boundaries of solution space and work within it. So we've talked about financial crisis and, and energy crisis and trust and complexity. Well, given that we're going to be facing limits in all of those spheres at the same time, if your solution is capital intensive, it's not going to work. If your solution is based on large-scale top-down trust in institutions, it's not going to work. If it's energy intensive, it's not going to work. If it rests on the current level of socioeconomic complexity, it has a structural dependence on that, it's not going to work. So given that those things lie outside of solution space, what lies within it? Well, things that are small and simple and local that give you control over the essentials of your own existence. Not necessarily at the individual level. I'm not trying to suggest that everyone should provide for everything themselves. That wouldn't be physically possible, especially not in, in such a heavily urbanized place as we find ourselves in Australia, one of the most urbanized countries, if not the most urbanized in the whole world. It's not like we're suddenly going to take all of Melbourne, where we are at the moment, and suddenly have everyone producing all their own food and water and, and everything else. But you can do it at a larger community level or you can move in that direction. It's about having local supply chains and local distribution networks and realistic expectations about what is possible so that we're not trying to, to provide for wants, which are insatiable and infinite. We're trying to provide for needs. And if we actually redefine what we're looking to supply and, and look only at needs, we actually find that there's a lot of spare capacity in our system that produces far more than basic needs. Mind you, as that system starts to contract and have its financial accident, its capacity to produce even basic needs will be constrained. But if we have put some effort in advance into providing for the kind of cohesion and the the kind of thought process that goes into creating local supply chains and local distribution networks, getting away from some of these other dependencies, if we've put the effort into that in advance, then we have a far better chance of being able to supply those basic needs at that profoundly local level. And exactly what level that will be will depend on, on where you are. We don't just need communities to be involved and individuals. We also need to encourage uh, businesses. Functional businesses are a major part of, of social cohesion at all times. Right now, we an awful lot of people who come from an environmental background tend to, immediately when you say business, they tend to, to think, well, that's all about money and money is grubby and if it all went away, then we'd just all be better off. So we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have any businesses. We should just have a moneyless economy and a gift economy. Everyone should be just doing things for each other. Unfortunately, that works at a very small scale, but it doesn't scale up beyond the point where you know people individually and you can trust them at, at that personal level. So if you have something that requires that level of personal trust because you are lacking that institutional level, which would be the next stage up, you can't scale it up beyond a certain point. And then it's not going to be enough to be able to allow us to function in societies that are inherently larger scale, like, like cities. If we want to function in larger scale environments, we have to have things that have a, a business function. It's a question of what business. So things that have that do not have dependencies on things that come from a long way out are, or dependencies on the availability of credit, for instance. These are going to be things that stand us in very good stead. If we can build the right kind of businesses while we still have the opportunity to do so, then those will be there to provide for basic human needs when, when push comes to shove and when, when we truly require them to do that. Now, right now, it's very difficult for people to start local businesses quite often because small-scale things are perceived to be risky. That means the cost of capital is quite high. And people want big returns on investment. They don't, at the moment, want to invest in small-scale organic production as often as they should because they can get a much bigger speculative return investing in, in financial assets. So people are stuck on the idea of yield. 
They want to get the biggest yield. They want their money to work for them as hard as it possibly can, deliver more and more returns. It's about living in a rentier economy. Economic rents are money that you get simply by virtue of having money, by virtue of owning particular assets. You get paid an income stream for, for not doing anything, simply by virtue of what you, what you own. So when people are seeking yields, they're actually chasing yield and chasing risk in the process. They're chasing the most speculative things because those are the things that give you the highest yield. In doing so, they're investing more and more in the Ponzi scheme and less and less in anything real. So more and more money is getting sucked into the speculative gambling casino, so much so that, that our current system is a planet-killing Ponzi scheme. It's a giant casino of absolutely epic proportions. And the development of that capitalistic casino has come at the direct expense of the availability of money for investment in the real economy doing real stuff. So we have to get away from our fixation on yield and say it's not the return on capital we should be looking for, it's the return of capital. So we need a capital preservation strategy. One way to do that, other than preserving capital as liquidity, which is something that you need to do to some extent in, in a financial crisis, but other than that, one way to preserve capital is to invest in things that make sense, to invest in things that are grounded in the real world. So if you're investing in local organic produce, for instance, then you're producing something that is real, that is going to have critical value to the people around you. And even in a period where there's not a lot of money going around, the most basic things are going to be where that, that remaining money gets focused. So you, you're not going to get a high return, not at all. For a period of time, you may get very little return at all. But nevertheless, if what you've invested in and, and helped to create survives, and it's far more likely to survive than any of these high-yielding financial things, you know, it's, it's not that there's no risk, but it's much, much lower. Even if the return is, is very low to, to nothing for a while, if the business survives, it will grow and it will prosper when the economy starts to recover. And you will have a return on investment that is vastly more secure than almost all the things people are currently investing in at the moment. So I think we, we need to look towards uh, building businesses as part of our resilience strategy. So we need to be thinking about where does our food come from? Where does our water come from? Our energy? How do we get around? Uh, where do the spare parts come for all the things that we currently depend on? What are our essential functions? And how many different ways can we supply those essential functions? Because it's not ultimately that we have to preserve one way of doing things. We need to preserve the ability to perform the essential function. And there may be multiple ways that one can do that. One example that I quite like to use is, is cooking. So if the essential function is cooking, you don't have to just think, well, then I'll have to keep my electric stove running then, come what may. You, chances are you won't be able to do that at some point in the future, but that's not the only way to cook. You can cook on an electric stove or a gas oven. You can cook on wood on a, an old aga. You can heat your water with it too. You can cook with propane in a barbecue. You can cook with butane in a Coleman stove. You can dig a fire pit outdoors. You can cook over an open fire. You can use solar cookers. There are so many ways that you can continue to provide that essential function. Most of the infrastructure for doing that is not even particularly expensive. So if we shift our mindset in terms of thinking of how we supply essential functions and essential needs, then that takes us a long way towards creating something that looks like resilience, where you have far more control over those essentials at a lower level of organization than it currently exists. And you want redundancy. You don't want everything to rely on one input scenario, where one input is critical and there is no other way to do it, and if you don't have that input, you are screwed. You want to try and think of other ways to serve those essential functions so that you can cope under a wider range of input scenarios so that what you have is flexibility in the face of uncertainty because that's the absolutely critical thing. You don't know in your local area what the future is going to look like. Although we can paint this big picture of where the world goes, it, it needs to be expressed far more locally to understand what it means for people in a specific area at a specific time. And there is 
quite a lot that's fundamentally unknowable about how that's going to work out. You know, the more you know about your local area, the more you may be able to predict what you'd have and wouldn't have. But nevertheless, it, it's still going to be a bit of a guessing game. So if you don't know specifically what your input scenario is going to be, you have to think in terms of being able to cope under a wider range of input scenarios. And that, that's the kind of shift of mindset that we actually have to make. We have to think, what can we substitute for what? Uh, what kinds of infrastructure do we need? Is there any way we can have things as simple as possible, as local as possible, not dependent on things that come from, from far overseas? This is what resilience looks like, and this is where solution space is, really needs to focus. Of course, permaculture is a huge part of solution space, because it's all about working with what you have, not fighting it all the time. If you look at, at modern industrial agriculture, or even pre-modern agriculture, once you moved into the Neolithic Revolution, it was all about wipe out existing ecosystems, uh, plant annual crops, uh, turn that into human biomass as quickly as you can, and while you're at it, have 10 kids, because you get more work out of them than it costs you to feed them, so then you, you have control over one of the factors of production, which is your own farm labor, same as you would have if you use animal labor. But then you've got 10 kids, and you can't divide your entire farm into 10, and then 10 again every generation. So you're on that expansionist trajectory from 10,000 years ago. It's agriculture that put us on that trajectory, not lending money at, at interest, for instance. So th we, we have that expansionist dynamic in the way we currently produce food that's all about fighting ecosystems, beat them back to bare earth, put in what we want, and repurpose everything for ourselves. Permaculture says don't do that. Work with ecosystems. Learn how ecosystems work. Work with the energy flows. Minimize the ones that are damaging. Work with and, and accentuate and benefit from the, the ones that are useful. Look at how you would set up your system in order to, to use the minimum amount of energy in harvesting what you need work with food forests and whole ecosystems integrated so it's plants it's animals animals doing what what it is the, that particular animal does perfectly happily and then benefiting from the ecosystem services it provides and then you just create win-win scenarios with permaculture all the time and it's not just sustainable sustainable is not nearly good enough this is what people talk about all the time we must have a sustainable society that implies the world is static and if there's one thing it has never ever been it's static you can't get to the maximum and then stay there what you need is not sustainable, you need regenerative. And that's exactly what permaculture provides you the ability to do. Rather than our extractive system, where we've constantly been sucking resources out all the time and, and cannibalizing, catabolizing our natural capital all the time, rather than doing that and leaving ourselves less and less and less ability to produce and meet our needs in the future, if you institute a permaculture system, you're actually rebuilding that natural capital. You're building soil fertility, for instance. You're building organic matter. You're building capacity to deliver needs. And you can create a situation of abundance, the kind of abundance that, that nature provides all by itself if we work with it or allow it to simply get on with what it does best rather than trying to fight with it all the time. We use huge amounts of energy and money to fight nature back at every opportunity and in doing so destroy our, our own potential future. If we don't do that, if we start making that shift of mindset into things that are fundamentally regenerative, then we have a much better capacity to be resilient because that is what gives us food sovereignty at a human scale in ways that are not destroying our ability for our children and grandchildren to do the same. So things that, that lie smack in the middle of solution space like that are absolutely where we need to focus our efforts. Yes, very much so, but not just energy descent. I think that's, that's going to be an issue going forward, clearly. But financial descent is going to happen first. So right now, we tend to, people tend to be maxed out. An awful lot of people are living hand to mouth. If they didn't earn their paycheck this month, they would have a problem. So that dependence on that continued income stream is a more acute issue than the dependence on energy and resources. All of them, of all of these things are going to be issues going forward. But the financial one will be first. I would say to people to, if you possibly can, hold no debt, hold 
uh, cash on hand, because cash is king in a period of, of deflationary deleveraging and financial collapse. And and as we've talked about, have control over the essentials of your own existence if you can. That's generally the recipe for being prepared uh, financially. Also, of course, building ties in the community so that you're working with other people because the, the greater the extent to which you can work with other people and their skill sets, the less you need to have money on hand. So have a time bank, for instance, where you're exchanging time and skills with no need to exchange money. That will help. Think about trying to live on half your current income and see, if, see what kind of life that would be if you were living on much, much less than you currently have available. Now, in doing that, not only will you be making in advance all the decisions you'd be forced to make later anyway, but you'll be able to make them in a context where you're, you're getting it right from the get-go is not absolutely critical because you still have some cushion left in your system. You don't want to wait until you have absolutely no choice. So I, I would say it's a bit like we're standing on the edge of a cliff and we're going over the edge. Like it or not, we're going over the edge. That, that's not up for debate. So what are you going to do? Are you going to stand on the edge of that cliff and wait for someone to shove you off? Or are you going to put on your parachute and jump? Because not that base jumping is without its risks, but it's a lot less risky than going over the edge without a parachute. <laughs> and so these are the sorts of things we need to think about. How would you live on much less money? Well, one way of doing it is to make sure you have no debt, because then you haven't got debt servicing built into that which you must earn every single month. Because the debt servicing will be expected even if you don't have enough money left over to eat and, and do all the other things that you need to do. The way the financial system is structured, the obligations to them are always considered paramount. So when we get ourselves into a position where we have no debt, we have a level of freedom that most of us can hardly imagine at the moment. Now, for a lot of people, that will mean not owning a property because almost everyone who's going to buy a property is going to have to borrow money to do it, unless you're incredibly lucky, or unless you build a tiny home, which of course is in solution space. So if you build a tiny home with recycled materials and your own labor and you're prepared to live in something small, you can own it outright, it can be built on wheels, it can be mobile, you can go to wherever you want. So there are things that work with, with that where you can own, but for most of us, home ownership means owning uh, bricks and mortar with a mortgage it's not going to be a good idea because the price of property has an enormous uh, amount to fall. And for most of us, that means negative equity. And in fact, it's not just having a small mortgage that's what you should be aiming for. It really needs to be having no mortgage because any level of debt is a risk. Property prices have a long way to fall. And in fact, the smaller the mortgage compared to the value of the house, the more attractive it would be for the lender to try and call in the loan because if they did that, there would be more to gain in terms of extracting equity. And in parts of the world, they have done that. Even when there's been no one has missed a payment, you can still get a margin call on your house if the value of that property has gone down to the point where the lender's no longer comfortable with the amount you owe on, on a property of that, that value. So if you can have no mortgage, you have a huge degree of freedom. I worry a lot about students as well, apart from mortgages on houses, I worry about student debt, which again is, is absolutely huge worldwide, and they don't even have something to sell in order to pay it off, other than their labor, but it's going to get an, an era of financial crisis, unemployment will go through the roof, selling your labor for any kind of reasonable return is going to get really hard, and you can't declare bankruptcy in a lot of parts of the world on student debt either. So my worry is that student debt is a recipe for having frog marched yourself into debt slavery, and indentured servitude, and things Things like that. So I think getting out of debt is incredibly important. You know, th there may not be an enormous amount of time, but whatever people can do to apply whatever resources they have to making sure they have no debt, that would be a wise, a wise thing to do. Or selling a property that has a large mor a mortgage on it. It's better to live in a closet that you own outright than it is to live in something that where you're effectively living beyond your means on, on borrowed money. So things, things like that are going to be are going to be so important. You know, for a lot of people, it means they're going to be renting. If you're not living in a tiny home that you can own for very little, then you're probably going to be renting. But renting is not throwing money out the window. Renting is paying someone else a fee to take the property price risk for you, which is a really, really good bet at the moment when property is so drastically overvalued in so many places. 
In some places, we haven't seen any housing bust at all. Other places, we've seen the beginning of it, like in the States. And the only reason they ever had any recovery was because the taxpayer backed all of it. Otherwise, there'd be no mortgages granted in the U.S. at all. But they still have the next shoe to drop. And many other places where we've seen phase one of the housing bust, there's still phase two and three and so on to come. So that, that, that getting out of debt, out of credit card debt, out of mortgage debt, I think all of these things give you a level of freedom that you couldn't really have in any other way. So preparing for financial crisis in that sort of way, being able to live on much less income, having no debt, having a certain amount of cash on hand, so that you, know, you don't, in the next Cyprus, if the banks all close their doors, you're not immediately hungry with no ability to buy any food or put gas in your car or anything like that. Those are the things to think about first. In the longer term, be thinking about energy descent, not just how much less money could you live on, but how much less energy. So are you really going to be able to keep driving your car? Will you be able to afford to put the gas in it? What happens when it needs repairs? Will you have the money to be able to repair it? What happens when it's no longer worth repairing it? Will you have the money to replace it? If not enough people have the money to replace vehicles, then the productive capacity for producing them will have gone out of business, so then there won't even be the capacity to do so. So how else are you going to get around? Where are you based? Are you in a place where you have to have a car, or could you cycle there? Could you walk there? If the answer is no, then maybe you'd like to relocate to somewhere closer to the things that you need to be near to in order that your energy dependency for transport is a lot less than it is currently. So these are the kinds of shifts of mindset people need to start making. And if you're renting, of course, it's easier to do that, to just say, well, here isn't going to work. This is clearly a trap because I need uh, fossil fuel transport to get absolutely anywhere from here. So if here is not a good place, maybe over there is because maybe I still have social capital there. Maybe I can get to a depression-proof, relatively depression-proof job by walking and things like that. Maybe I can live in a smaller space that costs an awful lot less to heat. Maybe I can look at ways in which people learn to keep themselves warm by heating the body rather than heating the space, for instance. So you sit there wrapped in a blanket with a hot water bottle, and you might not even need to heat your space in, in the winter, depending, of course, on just what your winter looks like. Winters in Canada, where I came from, not so, so much of a chance of, of that being effective. But in a lot of places, there are so many ways in which we could use less energy. And making those shifts and getting used to it in advance, I think, is going to be a very good idea. Because that which you are used to does not come as a shock. It's about adjusting your expectations in accordance with what reality will, be hope, will hope to be able to deliver in the future. And if you make that adjustment in advance and you learn how to live that way, even although you would have still have, the, have had the capacity to live the high life, uh, to a considerably larger extent. If you forego that opportunity in order to learn how to live simply, so that others may simply live, then that adjustment will not come as a shock to the people who are prepared in advance. And you don't have to be totally prepared at the leading edge of crisis, but it really helps to have started, to have wrapped your head around the fact you're going to need to do it, and then it can be a process. Dissent doesn't necessarily imply an instant descent, it can imply something that you do progressively as you need to. So starting with preparedness for financial crisis, moving into preparedness for energy crisis, and, and other things like not being able to get spare parts for that which uh, we currently rely on. And, and getting over our dependence on instant communication strategies, because we're not going to be repairing our own iPhones anytime soon. So at some point it won't be possible to have some of the things that we currently very much take for granted. And that's going to hurt because we're very addicted to that level of instant communication and, and convenience. So we are going to have to take a step back from that. I'm not saying that one should do that all of a sudden, because right now being connected to the world allows us to do things that we couldn't do otherwise. But we at least have to be prepared mentally for the fact that that won't always be possible, so that it doesn't come as too enormous a shock. Absolutely, because it's, it's about working with people. The DIY is do it yourself, but think how much more powerful it is to do it with others, to do things in ways that involve multiple people, because you can't do everything for yourself, typically. You know, as much of a generalist as people might conceivably be able to be, they cannot do everything for themselves. And even if they could, if you were sitting in a, a home with 
all your own food, all your own water, not having to worry about dependence on anything else for inputs or outputs. You were totally self-sufficient, but everyone around you was hungry. How long would your self-sufficiency last? And nobody would trust you. You would just have painted a giant target in the middle of your forehead and everyone would hate you. And that's not a recipe for having anything that's remotely going to last. So we really need to look to working with others in order to expand our skill base so that we're not forced to, to learn how to do everything ourselves. We're able to rely on the fact that other people have some skills that we don't have and we have skills that they don't have and put things together in ways that benefit everyone. And the huge advantage of doing that is you take your neighborhood along with you so that collectively you can be sufficient. Even if you could never be self-sufficient at that individual level, then you can, you can have something at a neighborhood level. Cohesive neighborhoods are also so much better at protecting themselves from things that come from outside that, that might not uh, be pleasant. So in times of upheaval, sometimes you get crime, very likely to get crime increasing and things going on that, that are the downside of contraction, when people are angry and seeking to blame others or take things from others. When you move into a situation where your whole neighborhood is cohesive and working together in order to collectively provide for your own needs, you're also able to keep a lot of those negative forces at bay. It keeps people in a constructive headspace. So if people know what they have to do and how to do it, and they're just in the process of getting on with it, they feel they have control over the essentials of their, of their own life. Locus of control is a really important psychological factor when it comes to whether or not we wallow in depression. If we feel that everything in life is beyond our control, the odds of us ending up depressed are very, very much higher. If we feel we have control, we know what we have to do, we're just putting one foot in front of another and getting it done, we don't get sucked into movements of anger and fear that will be getting a whole lot of traction on the downside. So we don't need to get people afraid of any of these things. That's not how you motivate people to do any of these things. Fear will get plenty of traction all by itself. We need to be short-circuiting that fear and that anger and not looking for, for revenge against so-called bad people who have done this to us. That's, that's not constructive at all. We need to be not going into any of these kinds of movements because they, they give political mandates to horrible extremists. And unfortunately, I think the odds of, of that happening in a number of parts of the world are un uncomfortably high. We need to short circuit that where we can. So the more cohesive a neighborhood is, the more people are, are on the constructive mindset side of things, the fewer people are on the unconstructive mindset side. In which case, you may be able to put a floor under how far contraction has to go. You might be able to say, okay, well, we're going to contract to a certain level. We'll, we have to work within the trust horizon at effective organizational scale, but we don't have to crash down to the Stone Age or, or end up with a Mad Max scenario. If you have no supply cushions whatsoever and, and you go down to the point where everybody's running around like headless chickens wrecking stuff, you, you end up with that kind of Mad Max scenario that just benefits absolutely nobody, where you, you end up with no social fabric remaining and everything collapses to a point where it's so much harder to rebuild anything at all because you're, you're starting from such a low level and you're having to, to reconstruct things in the face of mistrust and anger and everything else. If you have a cohesive environment socially, it cushions you from so many of those other things so that you don't con contract as far, you have more of a basis of trust to rebuild on. So it's about how do you get through the crunch period. So there's a period of crunch, several years of, of acute crunch very likely, but then how do you reboot the operating system? And if you have something lying around that works at a social fabric level, then those are the ideas people are likely to seize on to say this is how we rebuild our operating system or re reboot our system. Because our financial crisis is basically crashing the operating system. So we have the period of time where we'll be staring at the blue screen of death, where nothing much works because there's no money in circulation and that's what an economic depression actually looks like. So we'll move from, from that period 
to the need to reboot that system. You don't want it to be a bunch of fascist ideas that are the only things that are sitting around at the point where people are trying to rebuild the system. You want to have things that are, that are workable, that are demonstrably workable, that have had an opportunity to be field tested already. And when you have that kind of social cohesion, then the odds of being able to reboot the system from that basis are much, much higher. And people can survive almost anything if they have each other to, to work with. You don't need that much in the way of material things if you know that your neighbors have got your back. And any time you get overwhelmed by things, you can go next door and there's someone whose shoulder you can cry on. Or they can come to you. And, and, or someone whose tomatoes you can water, then they're coming and helping you fix your bike or whatever it might be. There are just so many advantages. There are no disadvantages to building community. And the potential advantages are absolutely massive. So I think that's something we really, really need to focus on. Absolutely they can, but we have to be careful about what we think of as realistic opportunities. So the naive optimism side of things takes us in directions where we say we can have all renewable energy by 2020, for instance. Techno-optimism in particular is, is really insidious. It's about telling us we don't actually have to change anything. We can still have everything we have now, so we don't really have to worry about any of these pesky limits. You know, we, we'll have everything we have now, we'll just do it all in a green sort of way, or it, somehow if we vote for the Green Party in whatever country, all our problems will be solved because we'll still have everything we have now, but it will be green. Somehow we won't be in a state of catabolism eating our own natural capital. But the, these things are incredibly naive and also incredibly dangerous because they just tell us we don't need to do anything. I think we have to have a recognition of the fact that we are facing limits and some sense of the relative time frame for the different limits that we're facing because then we know what we're trying to prepare for and we have an appropriate kind of sense of urgency as to the need to do it. So the human beings, as I've, I've intended to say before, have only two operating modes. There's complacency and panic, and there's not very much in between. And what I think we need is an informed sense of urgency as to the need to do things differently. So if people feel that something is personal and immediate, they're really quite likely to do something. If they really feel the consequences are going to hit them personally if they don't, then I think that the odds of this being motivating are much higher. Plus, if it can be motivating not just in a negative way, it's not about frightening people into doing something, but about saying, well, look at all the benefits that we can gain from voluntary simplicity, from moving forward in this way. You can make ideas so attractive that they go viral. I mean, things like the tiny home movement at the moment, that's just spreading all over the place. People are just catching fire with the idea of tiny homes. And all of a sudden it's become kind of sexy, if you like, to, to have that degree of control that you get and you're out of debt, you're free, you're mobile. So if you, if you cast these ideas in ways that are motivating because they're personal and immediate, but also profoundly attractive in their own right, and get them to go viral while we still have the capacity to do that technologically, you can engineer a tremendous shift in a relatively short space of time. So all sorts of ideas that have gone viral in the past have spread so quickly. Originally, when you haven't reached critical mass, you're constantly putting energy in to make something happen. As soon as you hit critical mass, it takes off and develops momentum of its own, it becomes a positive feedback loop where it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think it's going to be all about trying to make all the right kind of things to do go viral. And tell people this is freedom you can have freedom if you don't have debt you can you can live in a way that allows you to be able to sleep at night to not be constantly worried about whether or not your next paycheck's going to come and whether you're going to be able to pay the mortgage and all these other things when you know how to live simply the sense of freedom can be just overwhelming there's nothing as addictive as freedom and there's nothing as attractive either. So I think if, if, we, if we find the right way to, to explain our ideas to people and explain the ideas that are fundamentally workable in the first place, then there is so much that can be achieved. There's no need to despair. So on, on the way up, where I was telling people as the bubble was inflating, I was basically trying to take the punch bowl away and say, you know, this is irrational exuberance, this is a bubble, and this is not a good thing. And everyone was saying, oh, don't be silly, you're, you're a perma bear, you're just a, a, a doomer. 
Well, on the way down, they'll be calling me Pollyanna because it'll be my job to damp down the overreaction in the other side. I'll be saying, it's not that bad. The world isn't ending. You can do this and this and that. So leaving out the naive optimism and the things that are fundamentally unworkable still leaves us with plenty of things that we can do. But on the way down, people will be irrationally pessimistic to the same extent they were irrationally optimistic on the way up. And as a contrarian, my job and the job of everyone else in this field is to damp down the amplitude of those swings because it's the peaks and troughs where all the damage is really done. The peak of optimism has led us to collectively lose our minds and just assume that free lunches would always be there, that there was no such thing as limits, that we could just sit back and all be millionaires, like in the dot-com era when all 21-year-olds thought they were going to be internet millionaires by the time they were 25. You know, all these sorts of things. When we collectively lose our senses at peaks, we do a tremendous amount of damage to our system that we then have to pay back. And at troughs, where people are just in the depths of despair, then they tend to do horrible things to themselves, to each other, to the fabric of society. Damping down those fluctuations so that you don't experience the highest highs or the lowest lows is very much part of, of what we need to do as, as commentators. If we're trying to shape the future with our ideas, it's going to be incredibly important to keep people in a kind of rational space where they're not just devolving into this purely emotional state where they're picking up on the emotions of everyone else and reflecting and, and amplifying them at every stage. So that's where we get ourselves into real trouble, this human herding behavior, where we, we all pick up on the signals that we get from other people, amplify them all over the place without even any rational basis for them, and then we all turn into lemmings and throw ourselves off a cliff all at the same time. And unfortunately, this is what we do at large scale. It's another emergent property of scale that we have these huge swings of positive feedback. You didn't get that with hunter-gatherers. I mean, if one person looked alarmed, everyone might it might be really useful for everyone to run away because it was probably a lion or something in, in the bushes. At that stage, that scale, having the ability to have emotions be catching is useful, but not at the scale we operate now. It becomes another aspect of, of the sort of functional stupidity of our system or it's impervious to actual rationality the fact that, that we've lost that connection.